welcome everyone to our gaming careers panel. Um, as you may know, video gaming is one of the largest global entertainment industries. According to Statista.com, more than 44 million people in the UK alone play video games. Um, and it's a growing industry now worth um, billions of dollars. So with this in mind, there's an increasing number of job roles and opportunities in this field, many of which um, are creative and not purely technical in nature necessarily. So we've brought together a panel of people in just some of those roles to give insight and inspiration as to the possibilities that there might be in the industry for a career. So we're delighted to have with us Laura Dilloway, who's lead environment artist, um, Andrew Dodds, audio designer at Jagex, um, Charlie Housego, who's computer vision production engineer at Niantic, or Niantic, um, Vivian Midori, who's a 3D artist at Behaviour Interactive. Um, and I'm Jane Ansell, one of the careers consultants here at the Careers Service, and my colleague Krista Cooper is also here, I'm pleased to say, she managed to, managed to get in there, um, and she'll be helping manage the questions towards the end of the session. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat um, as they come to you, and we'll read them out uh, in the sort of second half of the session. So each panellist will have um, five minutes or so just to talk a little bit about um, their current role and what a typical day might look like for them, if there is such a thing. Um, and then I'll put some questions to the panellists and we'll have some discussion around those. And then it'll be your turn in the audience for the questions. So as I said, pop those in the chat and we'll, we'll be reading those out. So I think I'll start by going around my screen, which is probably easiest. And that's Andrew first. You want to start us off, Andrew? Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what your current role is like and what you what you do within that. Yeah, yeah happy to. Um, I'm Andrew and I'm an audio designer at Jagex, uh, which is probably best known for its MMOs RuneScape and Old School RuneScape, which you may either be playing now or you may have played in the last 20 years due to how long the game's been running for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been working here for the last uh, year and a half, actually, and um, I've been an audio professional for about seven years now. Um, if you'd read the bio that I gave to Jane uh, before the, the talks, you'll have probably seen that I've done quite a mix of things in my career uh, leading up to here, because audio is quite multidisciplinary. So I've worked in live music, TV, audio, uh, software and now in games um, it's a, quite a diverse profession and I've really met an audio designer or a composer or any of the roles you want to class in it uh, who hasn't done some subset of um, audio in their work up to their uh, area of the profession in games um, but depending on my day uh, the job can involve something like recording sounds and um, that could be on location or in the studio like on location, it could be like ambient bird song you're getting, or maybe some weather sound effects and stuff. But in the studio, you could be doing something like Foley and acting along with um, the animations and making the clothes sounds or the footsteps and stuff like that. Or you could be doing something particularly fun like smashing up fruit and veg to make gore sound libraries or uh, weapon impact sounds with some swords and shields, which is always fun. Um, then you can take all those assets and start designing sounds with them all um, and creating like... Um, all your finalised um, audio and manipulating it to put in the game. Um, and then if you're a bit more technical, you can begin implementing the sounds into a game engine um, and then making them trigger with some code or using um, special pieces of audio middleware, we call it. Um, or you could be creating technical audio systems that, you know, um, again, with more code to make the audio sound better in the game world and how it's going to play back to the, the player. Um, other creative sides of the field could be like more like composing and recording music, um, which, you know, is, uh, you know, everything from scoring all the way to actually doing the whole production of bands and stuff like that um, and are outsourcing the music to other talented musicians to play. Um, but yeah, um, as well as that, you know, we've, we create all the promotional trailers and videos for the, um, the uh, expansions or games going out um, and uh, obviously the, what's usually boring in other jobs we write a lot of documentation a lot of audio design documents but they're really fun for us because it just usually ends up with you watching a ton of YouTube videos on uh, your favourite games and uh, listening to how they sound or uh, playing those games I actually have got played to play other people's games and that's a, that's a fun job <laughs> um, so um, but yeah, uh, the work merges a lot of um, these tasks into like a varied and exciting day-to-day -day job, um, in my opinion, which um, 
we could be doing a different thing in a different area every day of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Jagex, we specifically have um, multidisciplinary roles, so I do a bit of everything. Um, but it's a very collaborative and social job. So, you know, you could be working with artists, engineers, uh, designers and everything outside of your own discipline just to figure out how to, you know, implement your sounds into the game or um, make them sync up with character animations and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, not all audio jobs are like this. Some are more um, focused and you are maybe just a sound designer or just a composer and you focus on really honing that skill set, but um, different studios have different ways of dealing with it. And in my one, you know, one day you could be recording assets, the next day you could be writing a music system. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> in the code, so it's a, that's my average day or average week for me, I suppose then. Great, thank you, Andrew, fascinating. Um, Laura, you're next on my screen. Hi everyone, really nice to see you here. Um, yeah, so I'm a lead environment artist. I've been based in Cambridge since I started my career about 16 years ago now. And uh, I started as a junior, just kind of worked my way up. It's always been environments for me. I know other artists kind of move around between disciplines, but for me, it's all about the big picture and the world that you're playing the game in. And my role really kind of varies based on the studio type that I'm working in and what is required from the role in those in those studios. So, you know, I've worked in a big what we call AAA studio, where it's very much like focusing on levels. And we had a team that made the assets and things that we used to build the levels for us. So it was taking those like a big Lego kit and and putting them all together and creating the the game world that you run around in. Uh, I also used to do a lot of wrangling with designers. So what they do is they'll hand us what we call the grey box, which is what it sounds like. It's grey and it's boxy and it looks very unimaginative. And it's part of my job to take that and reimagine it into the beautiful world that you then play in the game, which is a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of compromise. It's saying like, these shapes really don't suggest the thing that you want it to suggest and going back to them with a compromise and it's sort of working within their constraints and the things that they need to work for the design side of things and then at the same time pushing forward the overall vision and making the art look really cool at the same time um so in the again that's that role varies depending what kind of studio you're in what kind of uh game you're making as well like i've also worked for some really tiny companies where I had to be really, really hands-on and I was I was like in there in the thick of things where I was making the art as well as like helping the team push the vision forward and, and stay cohesive. And then I've worked at slightly larger places where I had to take a step back and, and help lay the ground for everyone around me. So, uh, you know, you get the experts to do all the really amazing stuff and then you're there driving the standard, making sure that everyone's working together, but also making sure that, you know, they've got the documentation that they need. They've got the stuff in place for them to do their jobs. They've got all the tools that they need. So you're working with coders to kind of like enable people to do their jobs and then sort of steering the ship a bit more. And the company that I actually just joined a couple of weeks ago, Airship Interactive, this is kind of like the other side of things. So we're what we call a service provider, which means that we help other people make their games, which is a slightly different environment entirely just in the way that it operates. But it's really, really interesting. There's really cool opportunities to work on games here that I would never have expected working in normal studios. And for me, being a lead in this kind of studio is more um, just sort of overseeing how all the projects in the studio work because we have a number at the same time. So I'm sort of like helping pull all the, the, the projects together, making sure everyone's communicating, that we're sharing knowledge, that we are like, you know, trying to move forward as a whole rather than separate entities. So lots of changes going on at the moment, but it's really exciting and really energizing. So. Thank you, Laura. Um, Vivian, you're next. Hi, hello. So my name is Vivian. Uh, I'm a 3D artist uh, slash level artist and a foliage artist as well uh, in my in my team, uh, I do have a similar role to Laura in the sense that I work in environments. Uh, in uh, I currently work at Behavior Interactive on a game that is called Dead by Daylight, uh, which is a horror game. Uh, and my day to day, I do um, wear different hats, as I mentioned. So I work on, in production for the assets, um, but I also uh, sometimes have to do the the level art, which is the the set dressing, imagining you know where things should go, uh, and mostly on the foliage. So I I'll be looking for you know vegetation and what kinds of uh, plants we're going to have in that certain environment, um, and 
what else? It's um, it's pretty much uh, uh, I don't know like what else to say, but uh, yeah, it's what um. I work on this on these assets, and yeah, we have we work in, in teams, so everyone have their their tasks, and uh, depending we we work in streams, and we produce a lot of different environments for uh, every three to four months. So we're gonna have we do research on what kind of environments we're gonna be working on, and and then yeah, pretty much that's it. Right, thank you, Vivian. And Charlie, thank last you. but not least. So um, I probably have a slightly different background from the other panelists today in that I am deeply technical and uh, my day to day is hardcore programming. But that doesn't mean that my role is not, uh, in its essence, creative. So I am a computer vision production engineer at Niantic. Um, even if you haven't heard the name Niantic, you will have heard of our biggest game, which is Pokemon Go, uh, and so which I have worked uh, directly on. Uh, my the, the company is focused in mobile gaming, which is the largest area in gaming at the moment. Uh, and we are also uh, a key technical contributor in the largest growth area in gaming at the moment, which is augmented reality. And the reason the world of mobile and augmented reality should be uh, high on your list uh, as a creative career is that it's very exciting. And also the rules are completely different. So when you're working in a, a game in an augmented reality uh, setting where you're fusing game assets with the real world, everything that you know about environment design, 3D art, character behavior, uh, and gameplay design is different. And none of it matches what you knew before because you don't know the environment that your game is going to be set in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came to Niantic from... Uh, a computer vision background. I was a robotics engineer before I uh, worked in games. And now my role is, uh, well, when I talk to internal teams, I like to talk of my role as being a possibility consultant. So I sit between multiple game teams at Niantic, and I also talk to our external game partners who want to build games with our technology stack. And they go, I want to do this. I want to create this behavior. I want this character to move in this way. I want to make the world look like this. And because the rules are different in AR, they don't know how to do that. And that's where my job comes in. So mm -hmm. uh, I work in a team of a, a small team based in the UK. Uh, we're a hybrid engineering team and research team. And creative individuals will come to us and say, we would like to make this, this, this kind of behavior happen. How can we do it? And then we'll go away and do projects and work on uh, Niantic's core platform. So Niantic Lightship is our effectively our augmented reality game engine. And through that, we will help those people realize uh, what they, they imagine. So I get to be very creative in my role because I'm given a task that's quite creative and people don't, don't know how to do it. And I go, well, can we, can we do this? Can we change it in this way to make it possible? Can we change it in, in this way to, to make it possible? And I've been very lucky to work with uh, amazing partners like the Pokemon Company. I've worked with Disney. I've worked with the Harry Potter studios on Wizards Unite. Uh, and um, I'm I'm here to to say that um, even I'm not sure how many technical people are, are on this call. Um, I'm sure there are some. And I want to say to those people, it's very, very easy to be creative in a, in a pure technical role mm -hmm. if you uh, uh, are determined and, and passionate enough about it then uh, you really can be. And likewise, creative people, if you feel like you're being sucked into having to do more coding and programming in your day-to-day, -day, which I'm sure everyone has felt a little bit, um, don't worry, it's still fun and uh, creative and uh, a really enjoyable experience. Fantastic, thank you, Charlie, that's great. Um, so we'll move on to a few um, questions now, and I'll, I'll just put these first few questions to all of you. So just chip in with whoever wants to start, just kind of unmute yourselves and, and um, and crack on with these. So I'm interested to know at what point did you realize that the gaming industry could be an area that you could forge a career in? Was there a kind of light bulb moment that you had and you decided I want to work in gaming or was it a very kind of organic, more natural, more kind of gradual process? Who wants to go first? Okay. Um, for me, like I, I've played games ever since I was a child, but I never really thought about where they came from. It was just a kind of, they were just there, really. And as I got older, uh, the games industry still had that very sort of 
sweaty dude in parents basement sort of stigma <laughs> attached to it so um I never really thought of it until I was at university and I I went to university to study uh, 3D art and animation because I wanted to work on uh, historical reconstruction programs. I don't know if anyone remembers Time Team, but I am a huge fan. But uh, I basically wanted to do the stuff where they find like little bits of pot and then they would 3D make the what the pot used to look like. And I thought that was super cool because it has all this like history stuff and geography stuff and all that kind of stuff tied into it. And so, yeah, I went to university to learn how to do that. And, you know, you do a wide range of things at university and okay yes my course was heavily geared towards film and tv but also there was game stuff in there and like it gave me a lot of core skills that were applicable to games and so in the third year when we had to do uh, a project that was set by industry I picked the one that most appealed to me and it just happened to be a games environment because it just seemed more interesting and I was offered an interview off the back of that project and at that point I was like oh Oh, I could do this. This is a thing now. Like, and yeah, it was it was a kind of light bulb moment in that sort of way. Like, I, it just this is a long time ago now. Like, you know, I never thought of it because of the stigma that was on it. But that is changing so massively these days. And you've got people that are like, I am doing this, and then they are planning their whole life to get into it. And it's amazing to see mm -hmm. that. But yeah, I'm one of those people that fell into it. Really, I never knew what I wanted to do, but I ended somewhere I love. So, right. Anybody else? Yeah, oh, for me, uh, it was, uh, I've always wanted to work in a creative job. Uh, and I had already studied architectural drawing during the time that I was studying to enter university because I wanted to uh, do a industrial design course at the time. Uh, but in the end, I ended up pursuing a bunch of different things. I went to photography, uh, then I ended up working as a freelance photographer for quite a while. Uh, but I never could make a full-time career out of it. And then after many years, uh, I was already with my current partner, and he's an animator in film. It was when I learned, oh, there's all this world, uh, you know, I can actually be an architect, but for games. <laughs> and it was when I I learned about the about this kind of careers in games, and I decided to pursue uh, you know career. And I went to school, and yeah, and, and I'm I'm here now. All right. Maybe I'll start to share that story. Yeah, sure. Um, it, I think I came to the idea of it quite late. In all seriousness, I was also had no idea of what I wanted to do with my life. I'd been an electrician before I did this. <laughs> Nothing to do with games altogether. And uh, we, I just went to college because I was like, oh, music. I like music. I'll figure out how to make music. Um, but yeah, I think it's that kind of thing where, you know, we, had, we did that one module in the second year of college because there was no uh, straight uni degrees in Scotland at the time. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just go straight to uni to study games or anything like that. It just didn't exist. Uh, for audio especially um so we well i you know second year of college there was a one unit where you had to make sound effects for an animation and i was just like this is a job this is something <laughs> someone can do yeah absolutely so i just ran with it started searching after that what universities could offer that and luckily up in dundee there was Aberdeen university which was uh one of the more um well-established ones for doing it so I ended up going there and that's when I was like after that point in time there was no other career path it was just I am doing games yeah. I have to get into games so yeah so it sounds very much based on experience isn't it and um sort of discovery as well as you're going along yeah how about you Charlie how sure um uh, I, I can share my story um I had never ever considered a career in games in my life despite being a really like passionate gamer uh, mostly because uh, and I'm sure this actually is a story that many people might resonate with uh, I had felt like some stigma from my parents and people around me that the, a career in gaming is, wasn't a real job and wasn't a real career so I um, I went off and studied physics and then programming and then became a robotics engineer and I discovered that I could turn those skills to gaming uh, actually on a tinder date <laughs> <laughs> where I went on a date with someone who worked at Niantic and was talking to them about what they did and was like wait hang on actually all of my skills do that and so now I work at Niantic brilliant what a great story <laughs> <laughs> oh 
That's fantastic. Um, just talking about kind of experiences and discovery. Um, when you were at university and in your kind of, you know, your extracurricular activities, a lot of you said that you played real passionate gaming as, as a hobby. Um, what type of skills do you think you, you've drawn from those different experiences, aside from your kind of academic studies that have really helped you, you know, be competitive in this market and really do your job well as you do now? Shall I go again? Sorry, I keep going first. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, interestingly, at university, we had very little time for extracurricular activities mm -hmm. in the first and second year because our schedule was mad. Um, I had something like 25 hours of lectures the first two years. And then in the third year, it went down to six, which was mm -hmm. great, actually. Um, so, yeah, like even Wednesday afternoon, which is supposed to be sports day, we just didn't get to do. But like, you know, what we were doing instead was we were working together. Like it's the teamwork stuff that I think sticks out to me most as when I look back at what I gained holistically from university is that like you know the long nights and the labs where we were all like oh I'm really stuck with this thing can you help me out or like mm -hmm. oh I've got a great script that will help you and sort of like supporting each other and sharing knowledge and giving each other feedback on what we thought on each other's work they were so so invaluable because like that's the stuff that we use every single day in in working life and the other thing I think that really stood out was like you know not necessarily hobbies because there wasn't a huge amount of time, but just consuming other media. So like, you know, stories, books, films, a lot of that, like music, going to exhibitions, just like generally absorbing like art and culture and being creative in a sort of holistic way rather than mm -hmm. just kind of in a work sort of way. Um, and just kind of letting everything that was around you influence your work. I think it's so important to like try and stay rounded as a person, even when you're super passionate about one thing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? Are there activities you particularly drew from? Um, I, I kind of resonated with a lot of the ones that Laura was saying there, to be honest. Uh, but like, um, when, she, when you said about like going out and like going to gigs was one of them as well. You know, you'll go to them and you'll listen, and you'll get really inspired by something. You'll take it back and try to write a piece of music based on like just a fun experience. But as well as that, being just around other people or other other like game devs, whether they're you know no matter what um, discipline they're in I find like going to game dev meetups were the one of some of the best ways to spark interest and in, and in, in, in interesting ideas for you to do it and you would grow quite quickly from that and a lot of the time as well I don't know maybe it's just because we're all uh, sound designers but we all ended up in the pub a lot so there's a mm -hmm. lot of chat around tables having drinks and then you'll suddenly be like actually I think we just came up with the answer to that module let's mm -hmm. like everybody back come on let's get this written up quickly well we all remember it so there's a lot of collaboration and no one, I think everybody shares a lot of stuff in games. No one, no, there's no like closed walls. There's no like hiding your t techniques. It's like trying to open the door for everyone to get hold of them. So the more talking you did, the better. But the, also the other one was game jams. Can't go wrong mm. with doing a game jam. They're always great fun and you get so much out of them. Thank you. Anybody else? Are there any sort of, I'm thinking along sort of skill shortages that you that you see now in the industry or you kind of predict might be a, a you know shortage of a skill that people could really start to develop now where they've got that time before they enter the industry i'm going in again i'm going to say mm -hmm. soft skills um soft skills are so important like you can be the most brilliant artist at what you do but if you're a jerk nobody will want to work mm -hmm. with you like you have to be a team player you have to be able to take feedback you have to be able to listen to that and like act on it without taking it personally and like you know I'm sure you are already doing a lot of that stuff in lectures or seminars or you know you're getting stuff from your professors and acting that in your work right now like all of that stuff is going to be super duper useful but in terms of like skills I think we're lacking it's it's always technical artists weirdly enough like it is a creative career but it's slightly technical but we need those people um lighting artists are like gold dust and um people who can use a program called houdini which is amazing for like procedural uh assets and world building like unicorns if you can be one of those <laughs> you will be raking it in forever like um yeah uh, yeah just those people really <laughs> Uh, there's lots of nodding going on around my screen, so <laughs> you're saying some great things here. Um, has anyone got anything to add to that before I move on? Well, just to comment on what Laura said, uh, people need to remember that, you know, 
building a game, making a game is a collective work. Mm -hmm. So that's why the soft skills are so, so important because it's not like, okay, I'll, I'll do my work and I don't need to talk to you. I mean, you're just doing a little piece and then your little piece depends on this other person's little piece and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it does. It's something that we do see that it's, uh, you know, sometimes people lack and mm -hmm. it's really, really important. Yeah. Right, thank you everyone, that's that's fantastic. Um, we'll just move on to some more. Oh, Krista, did you want to say something? Yeah, I've got, um, well, I've got a question from um, from the audience. I don't know if you want to ask that now. It was kind of related to your question about extracurricular mm. activities. Um, but yeah. I don't know the answer to this question, but some other students might do. Um, does the university have a group for collaborating on games together, um, get game jams, etc.? Um, I'm not sure the panel would would know or have ideas on that. Um, or if there's any other students that do know, then please feel free to pop it into the chat. There is an answer and a link in the chat for a game oh, jam in sorry. ten days, I believe. Oh, oh yes, brilliant. just come in. Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> Thanks for spotting that. Brilliant. Oh, and even outside of the university stuff, you can check out things like Global Game Jam and all those other big ones that are everybody attends them from all over the world. If you look on itch.io, then every week basically as well. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Krista. Um, so if we just move to some more sort of specific, I've got a question for Vivian and Laura um, particularly. So what what's the balance between your artistic ability and your technical know-how and your kind of day-to-day -day role? How do, how do you balance those and, you know, what is the kind of percentage of each, if you can put a, a figure on it? I can go first just for a change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, um, well, I need to create some, I do mostly like the, the assets for the, for the environment. So I need to create something that is uh, visually appealing, but at the same time conforms to the technical constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that you need to learn where you, you know, where you're going to spend, you know, the, those valuable polygons or, you know, that texture that, that is going to be a little bit more costly, but then it's uh, going to be really worth it and where you can cut costs to help performance. Um, but also, but without compromising the, the final result. So I think that's a, uh, it's something that you need to learn the, the balance and you need to be creative uh, sometimes in order to uh, create things that uh, um, are in performance wise uh, are good and visually speaking as well. They are also pleasing. Laura, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I wrote some notes before we started and I pretty mm. much that really like you, there are definitely levels. So like if you are just making assets, then you could argue that once you learn the relevant software and get the budget criteria that you have to stick to, which will have stuff to do with performance and, and where you put your polygons and things, then you feasibly could maybe just make nice objects and not worry about too much else. But as soon as you start getting into levels and like the kind of a bigger picture things, then you need a bit more technical knowledge about what impacts frame rate, how the construction of the environments impacts like the CPU or the GPU of the system that you're running on and sort of how to plan and mitigate for that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't think you could completely avoid being a like a bit technically savvy, mm -hmm. but there are definitely layers to how much you need depending on where you want to end up. Mm -hmm. I do, do you ever get a chance to kind of um, choose the type of games you work on or is that do people working in your area of the industry get to, to specialize in a certain type of game further down the line in your career or is it something you just kind of take on any work because you're working in that industry how does how does that work uh, I think it depends a bit what sort of life you want for yourself like if you mm. work for a studio and you have a permanent contract which is obviously great then you know you you're sort of bound to what the studio is making and you do mm. get a choice in that you can choose what studios you apply to work for and they will inevitably have styles of games that they work on and types of game that they work on if you wanted to have a bit more freedom then you could choose to go freelance but obviously there are plus sides and downsides to that like okay yes you get a lot more flexibility to go where you want for shorter term contracts potentially but there's all the uncertainty about 
being employed, being having a, having mm. a next job lined up, and and benefits and things tend to not be a thing. Um, so yeah, like I, it is it you know you can choose, um, but once you're at a place, then you kind of you're not going to get much say over what the game is and what they're making unless you're like super duper high up, like a game mm. director or art director, where you're inputting into like the very core idea of the game. The interesting thing about working for a company like Airship or an outsource company is that we. <laughs> we actually get loads and loads of things. So I, I work for one studio, but I get to work on a whole type, a whole load of types of games, which is um, really exciting um, and quite different for me. I'm used to just being in mm. one place. Um, so that's another way of looking at stuff. And there's a whole bunch of studios that do outsource work. It's not just us. Um, and yeah, I think particularly as a lead, like I, for me, this is definitely something that shifted in the last few years of my career is that I have to make a team believe in a product as well. So like for me, it's it's even more important than that I am interested in the game that I'm working on and that I'm really driven by the game that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. like, like I definitely in the past have been like, well, I'm here, I'm making this thing, it's fine. Whereas now I'm like, I need to love it like because I need everyone else to love it. And if I can't show that to them, then they're not gonna have it themselves. So yeah. That's great, thank you. Vivi, did you choose to work on you know, is, is kind of working on the horror game side of things something that really, really appeals to you? Or is that just something you have kind of ended up doing in terms of the subject matter? Well, yeah, I, I wasn't particularly interested in horror games at first, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to work uh, in games with a more realistic style. So this is something that you also get to choose. Uh, if, when you start looking for a job and uh, applying, you know, to... Um, you know, uh, applying to studios, you need to see what kind of projects they have. So are you going to go for a more stylized kind of project or realistic? Because you need to have the, the portfolio to back it up. Uh, if you have a, porf a portfolio that is extremely stylized and you're applying for a very realistic games, even though you're really, really good, chances are you're not get you're not going to get hired and vice versa. Uh, so I... I always, I always wanted to work in a more realistic style, and then I ended up getting this job on Dead by Daylight, uh, which is, you know, this horror. But um, even though we do stylize a few things, but it's pretty much based in reality. And my studio is, is also similar to Laura's, that we have a division that is also, um, you know, uh, they get like contract work from other studios. Uh, and you get to, you you get to work in different titles if you want so if you want to but uh, at the at the moment I'm only working on Dead by Daylight and since it's online it's an online game and it's ongoing it's on the seventh year right now uh, yeah I'll be working on it for a while more but then if I really want to switch projects I'm gonna have to either apply internally to one of these other projects that we have the because uh, we also do this outsourcing work mm -hmm. or change jobs, yeah, pretty much. Great. Thank you both. That's really interesting. Um, Andrew, I'll just move to you for a moment. Um, I know when we were talking before, before the panel, um, we were having our introductory chat and you were talking about how important networking has been to you and, and kind of really maintaining and nurturing those contacts. Um, do you what do you feel is the most effective way of doing that kind of starting to build your network and, and really starting to build contacts in the industry and how do you sort of go about doing that in the most effective way yeah um i think that one of the hard things about audio is without networking you just you just 100 percent would not get a job in this mm -hmm. section you know it's, it's it's a lot of who you know um skills are obviously important but i've i've met audio directors who've like said you know it's like the you can train someone up to be a really good sound designer you can't fight but you need to be able to find them and it's just like finding them is a lot more difficult for some reason because it's, it's it's everybody you know a job application for a sound designer has like thousands of applications mm -hmm. especially if it's a junior one like good luck getting through it's a it's a messy application process so yeah methods um i don't think any method is better than the other from the two I'm going to suggest, but it's like, it's obviously there's the online presence and then there's your in-person presence. Um, 
to me. And I think trying to get that split between the two of them is incredibly important. You know, um, a lot of sound designers are very vocal online and, and tend to have a lot of like showing their showreels an awful lot. You know, you want to be part of the communities and, and talking about the newest pieces of software and the newest like um, method of, you know, getting your audio to work better inside your game engines or the newest piece of middleware or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you can have a good social media presence and talk and have discussions and just show that you openly enjoy the field. Mm -hmm. It's a really good way to do one of them. Um, but there's some people who write blogs about making audio. There's some people who um, even like review like on, on, um, on Twitch, there's a, 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 um, a channel that called Power Up Audio, which literally will review your show reel live with other sound designers and give feed, like really in-depth and detailed feedback that can sometimes make you go, oh, is my audio that like needing that much work? But it really does make you a better sound designer. So getting out and getting your stuff out there and, and showing it online is really important, even though it's terrifying to, to put your first piece of work out there and be told that it's not good enough and you have to build up to it. Um, and then the other way is, the one I, I prefer, because I'm more of an in-person kind of person, um, social gatherings. There's always an audio meetup somewhere um, or a games development meetup. Um, uh, the audio ones, like there's, there's some great groups like um, Game Audio Nexus, that all over the UK, you could be jumping to them. When I was in Scotland, they had specific Scottish ones like the Scottish Audio Network and things like that and that, that was all really good and even like Game Drinks London um, uh, Game Audio Drinks London and stuff like that um, which is like as you can see a lot of audio is spent um, like meeting up in nice social situations and, and, and chatting with people but I think an important bit about it is and I've spoken with like my lead and other people about this as well is um, your eagerness to get into the industry it's not like going along to these things and going hey can I get a job it's more of like mm -hmm. going along and being like talking to people about audio and and, and actually be there because you enjoy audio and uh, never forget just like strange discussions about like it was a time when there was a new um, digital audio workstation which is where you manipulate all your audio and make it sound the way you wanted to and this new one would come about with all these new features and everybody was talking about it. And I remember being so excited to run home and download this piece of software just so I could try it how the audio worked. And it was just, so it, it's the reason to go along to them is you'll find out really cool technical abilities mm -hmm. and professional skills that you will absolutely need for it. So yeah, networking is is great for getting yourself out there, but also for learning what is what are all the other professionals doing? Because these audio meetups will have people who are like, lead audio designer at playstation um as mm. well as um me showing up for the first time being like hi i want to do audio <laughs> any 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 help please <laughs> you know and it's just all about the sincerity of it in my opinion yeah. but yeah networking is really important fabulous thank you i'm going to move on to the questions because we've got loads of questions in the chat which is brilliant and i, I want to give enough time to get to those um Charlie, I just want to ask you a little bit more about your, you have some really creative interests outside your work, um, sort of musical theatre, children's entertainer, you made a documentary, um, lots of different things. So which artistic elements do you really bring to your work? And do you think this general kind of creativity has really helped you to succeed or advance? I don't think that I could do the job that I currently do without having the huge backdrop of creative interest that I have that I've pursued my whole life. I I don't think I'd ever have been satisfied being a, a purely technical person. I, I probably like everybody on this call, I crave a creative outlet. And the amazing thing that I find about working in, in the gaming industry is how much has to cross back and forth across that line between... I, I, I'm doing this amazing creative project. Oh, but it's completely unsuited to what we can actually like ship in our game. Or I've built this like brilliant technical system here for our game, but the creative people they they don't want to use it because it's it, it doesn't match their vision. So the the only way to be successful uh, on that interface in gaming is to understand both sides, mm -hmm. because if you if you only have an interest in knowledge in one, you will miss your ability to make the maximum contribution in the team that you work in by like 
threading those uh, lines bet between the teams uh, uh, and amplifying it. So I think the had I not pursued like creative just for a long time, I wouldn't understand the the purely creative people that I work with. And if I didn't have uh, my technical background, I wouldn't understand the, the purely technical people that I work with. So, uh, and there are a lot of roles like that in the gaming industry. And particularly those roles are in very, very high demand. Like people who can, people who can sit on both sides, who can understand the problems and challenges, both from a creative perspective and from, from a technical perspective, mm. uh, they are the hardest to find people in companies. And most of the time when we're recruiting for roles in particular, that's where that's where people fall out, fall down and, and miss out on getting roles because they only know one side and that those people just aren't as valuable to like the organization as people who can do bits of both. And yeah, yeah good to know that you can build up all those skills in your extracurricular right. activities as well. It doesn't have to be in a working environment, does it? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and it's like where you're at university now, you kind of when you're going and to choose your degree you kind of have to specialize and i don't actually i don't know what the uh, the the balance in the 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 gaming uh, um courses at, at, at cambridge are i don't i don't recall them being there when, when i was there um but either of those sides you can build without without that being specifically what you're you're studying so if you're studying a purely creative um degree build some of the technical skills on the side. If you're studying a purely technical degree, build some of the creative skills on the side because they will they will be invaluable in this industry mm -hmm. and they will really, really set you apart from people who haven't done that. I think we talked a little bit before about the, the more purely creative roles. Do you feel you, you always will have to have a certain level of technical um, knowledge and ability and is that something you can train for is that something you can just kind of build up in your spare time in the same way you can on the creative side um it is very rare it, in the people that i've worked with to find mm. someone who is purely creative and doesn't have to get stuck in a little bit on the technical side at side and elements of it uh those people are yeah they're very infrequent i can think of maybe one in the entire company that, that i've ever worked with mm. and the so one of the challenges is particularly i think for my like in in my company in my world we work with a lot of external partners and so a lot the, a lot of the time the the purely creative people are the external partners and they don't want any of our internal like purely creative people doing anything because they're like well this this is our ip we don't we, we don't want that space for you so uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of push and pull and i will say it's very very easy to build um technical skills on the side if you're a purely creative in individual the internet is absolutely flooded with amazing online like walkthroughs and tutorials and platforms to help you build those like core technical skills mm -hmm. and to learn to use those um, programs that, and applications that you'll need in in a creative role in the gaming industry and a lot of those uh, programs and platforms have also free student licenses which i think you can get through the university i i need to double check that but but it's mm -hmm. worth exploring because they do all have offers and packages for students so now is the time while you're at university and you've got those resources available to you through like the student licensing to start start building those outside of your your degree studying yeah. this actually came up in the social media panel we did last night um to say that youtube is a fantastic resource as well where that's concerned um but there may be some more specific places to look as well we'll send this to to the audience in our resources afterwards um that's really helpful. Do you think it's, and this is to everyone really, do you think it's important to have formal training in those things to be able to demonstrate your expertise or is it enough to be to be building that in your spare time and using that as kind of evidence? How is it viewed from an employer point of view, do you think? I, I can't talk for all the other disciplines, but from an audio perspective, it, it, like... This is a really hard one because it's 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 good to have some formal training in something, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily need to be the thing you're doing. Because uh, we've come across like sound designers who have done, as you said, like who have completely done a a, a coding a coding degree somewhere, and then they've just learned sound in their own time. They've learned what all the middlewares are. They've learned how to implement it, and they're making better games. Then, then, then other people, and you're like, "Wow, this audio is incredible!" And it's like, but this person has literally just went, "Oh, I just just 
learned it in my spare time watching YouTube videos, as you said, or, or other resources. And it's vice versa as well. If you're if you've started as a sound designer, you really can't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Like um, I, I've done a bunch of code courses and. Um, and Unreal and stuff like that, just so I could understand exactly how to make a system work because I wanted it to do something that it won't do unless I know how to make it happen. So even at this stage, so I think everybody is kind of multidisciplinary and that you've got all these free resources. And audio is really beneficial as well because everything is actually free for student levels. And actually, even if you just say you're an indie, at the point in time, an indie that's not going to put your game out, you can get everything for free, like um, Wise and FMOD, all free licenses for implementing your audio. Unreal's free, Unity's free, everything's free. Great, thank you. Um, I think, can I can I quickly yes. add one thing to that? Of course, yeah. Um, which is that um, I there there is an element where having some kind of like formal certification is very valuable in that this industry is incredibly competitive. Um, there are usually hundreds of people applying for every role. And a lot of companies are doing pre-filtering of CVs based on um, like tick boxing. So a lot of the time a human being won't even look at, at your work. So even if you have an online portfolio of work, you have a big social media following, if you don't have uh, like, the, if you don't meet the tick box on your CV that says you have some qualification in here, no one will ever see that. Um, it's quite easy to get certifications in the technical side. It's very, very easy to just do like an online exam, get an online certificate, put it on your put it on your CV. The, those are out there. It will maybe take you like a day at the weekends to go and do that like online certification if you've been building those skills on the side. And it really, really is worth putting that little bit of extra time in once you've built the skills to get some formal certification. Mm -hmm. I am going to counter this. Yeah. <laughs> um, as an artist, like we do a lot of hiring simply through ArtStation. We just look at portfolios. And like Vivian already mentioned about having a really great portfolio, like you could feasibly just have a great portfolio and no specific game dev qualification. I, I actually know people who've done that and they have had brilliant careers and they are brilliant artists. Um, I do think the thing that studying and doing a course gives you in the same way that Andrew was saying like you know having something in your back pocket is I think it gives you discipline and I think it gives it structure so like you know you work to deadlines you know how to be a bit organized like all of that stuff will stand you in really good stead instead of just kind of chaos so um you know there's stuff that you're doing now that would if you then had a really great portfolio would be great even if you've never studied game dev in a, an official did a degree and it did a course in it capacity. Thank you, Laura. That's great to have that other perspective. Vivian, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just exactly what Laura said. And for us, it's uh you might have, I don't know, like a, a postgrad in the best school in whatever it is. Uh, but if your portfolio is not good, you're not gonna get the job. That's pretty much what happens in the art side. And yeah. the opposite is, is you know, it's true. Like she said, you might not have a formal training, but if you have an amazing portfolio, you're most likely getting the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we're going to move to questions. Thank you so much, everyone. But we've got lots of really interesting questions in the chat. So, Krista, are you there? I am. You are. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to read? Yeah. Read them out, and we'll Absolutely. start to work through them. Thank you. I'll, um, I'm just going to go slightly out of order because just sort of touching on what you have been talking about recently, and it, it seems as though, you know, quite a big theme coming from the questions is, is, is around this. So, and you kind of, you touched on it earlier, the panel did in terms of the degree subjects that you can study at Cambridge and how that might be related to these, to the roles within the gaming industry. So we've obviously got um, a mixture of students from different degree subjects on the call today. You can see we've got some computer scientists and some people sort of from our arts and humanities, humanities and social sciences area as well. So there's been quite a few questions around uh, what sort of technical skills, I might get onto those in a minute, but quite a few from people who are in that sort of arts and humanities type background um, asking about what, what sort of routes could they take to get into this industry. So getting into a creative career, not necessarily having a sort of a technical degree uh, background. <laughs> yeah, 
they do a good one there to start off with. <laughs> um, there's um, a few more specific I, examples. Do you want me to read through some of those, or do you want to? I could, I could it? say one small thing about that as well. And it yeah. was something that my my lead actually told me to say the other day when I was talking to him about these questions. I asked him, he said, "Everybody, to see what are needed for the jobs, just go and look at job art adverts for these roles and see what they're looking for, and then go and search what that is and learn it because." That's how you find the that's how a lot of us find the skills. You don't necessarily all get it in your education either. Like my yeah. my formal education didn't teach me to start off with the first bit about middleware, about audio programming. I had to find that out later on just by looking at what the job requirements were. Yeah, very good. Very good tip for sure. To put some specifics on that, I guess you could say, so like Unity runs on C sharp, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, Unreal is C++. If you can do Python, that's amazing for tools and just general stuff. Um, I'm also just skimming through the chat here. Um, so routes for entering the industry that is risk averse to hiring and training juniors, it's changing. There are internships are becoming a big thing and internships that specifically mm -hmm. don't accept people who've already had training in game development. Um, so if you just have a look around for some of those, like some that have come into my awareness quite recently have been uh, XR Games, which is up in Leeds. I know they're doing one and they definitely have an art track. Um, and PlayStation is offering them down in London Studio. Like there's there's more, there's definitely more and they're becoming way more of a thing just literally in the last in the last year, I think, actually. So that could definitely be something. Um, and yeah, they specifically said you don't need training and we won't accept you if you do have training. So that could be a great, great route to go into. Yeah, that, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, so someone was sort of asking about the languages and software that are most valuable uh, to learn if you want to break into the gaming industry, which you kind of touched on um, a bit there. Laura, would anyone recommend any other languages or software? Software depends on what you're doing. Um, so I'm sure Andrew would have a different opinion. Vivian, I'm sure, could give us loads, and Charlie will have something as well. And I've talked a lot. <laughs> so Laura has already actually touched on uh, the the main world that I work in, which is the world of Python, C plus plus, and, and C sharp. Um, but that's because I work like on the core engine level. And I'm sure if you're if you're like designing, like, creating assets, there'll be specific programs that that are, are used for that that I'll be less familiar with than the other panelists. So I'll I'll, I'll let them speak to those. Um, someone was asking about um, building the necessary skill set um, for the less technical roles. Um, so looking at roles in producing project management, story design, et cetera, and what the recruitment process might be like for that. And that was from Peter. I think, it, you, sorry. <laughs> I think it depends on it certainly depends on the the kind of, of project management that you're doing certainly within different teams in our company there are project managers but most of them are people who previously did the role that they now manage and the the company has sent them on development training to build management skills that that speaks to me I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a manager of a, of a small team but I wasn't when I started and the the company trained me up to do that um I don't know if that's the same in in in, in other worlds. And you can be a producer without prior experience of the role, but I think you make a better producer if you know, because you just have an intrinsic understanding of what a role involves rather than just not having any background on it. Um, so yeah, I definitely know a lot of people who've been, let's say, character artists and then gone on to be lead character artists and then character art producers, for example. Um, but obviously that would mean that as an artist, you need to take a step back and just be doing spreadsheets, which is a battle for yourself to, to worry about. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, we've got a question from Naya. I'm asking about how would I start training in my spare time to become a technical artist um, or should I start out in environment art slash 3D art first? <laughs> well, I I think Laura might be able to give up um, also a more complete answer. But uh, as far as I understand, to be a technical artist, you do need to you know uh, at least know the basics. You don't need to be an expert 3D artist to become a technical artist, uh, but you do need to learn the basics because you you're going to be validating. Uh, the 3D artist assets, <laughs> so you need to know what's uh, what's right, what's wrong, what's possible. Um, so yeah, pretty much. I think it's a 
the first step, pretty art is the first step and then you don't need to progress in the career, then you can, you know, uh, step aside and uh, become a technical artist. Like art, it's kind of like a bridge between disciplines and that's why they're so useful. So they're quite often solving a problem that the environment team have, but they're coming at it from a slightly more codey, programmy sort of direction. So they might be writing a shader that does something really, really cool in the environment, or they might be doing something with the render pipeline that makes the game look really interesting and unique. So um, training wise, I would find a problem and try and solve it um which you know it could be just be like oh I've seen this really cool effect like let's see if I can make it do that like in using Unreal or Unity Unity they do have a shader graph now but um you used to just have to do it in shader code which is a bit crazy whereas Unreal has a node-based graph which you can just kind of poke around with and make it do all the stuff so that could be a place to start just to sort of fiddle around and see what does what um and then other stuff that tech artists can do is um, making scripts to, to sort of speed things up. So they do a lot of the Python work. So they, if you're doing something really, really repetitive that a button could do a lot better, then they might write the thing that makes the button nicer. So like Vivian talked about like validation and things like that. Like, you know, they, if you're trying to export something in a particular way or if you're trying to convert something in a particular way and you need to run it through a process that does the exact same thing every single time then that's the kind of thing that tech art can help with because they need to understand what the art is trying to achieve at the end of it and they need to understand the code side of it whereas a coder wouldn't necessarily understand fully the art side of things so that's why they're so useful um they also can do a lot of stuff to do with lighting as well to be honest they don't need to be a specific lighting artist so you know, making the environments come alive, like figuring out, oh gosh, like how many lights you can have and how they interact with each other and how all the effects work and, and all that kind of stuff. There's, yeah, there's a huge amount that they could do. But just just play, get an engine and have a go. <laughs> <laughs> I think Naya liked your answer. 100,000% sold on technical arts? Excellent. <laughs> um, I'm just going to jump right back to the top of the question because I know that I missed one right at the top here from Adam uh, asking, how does it work in terms of creating story content for games um, and possible career goals? I think there's a difficulty. Go. <laughs> I was going to say, I was, uh, you, on you go, I was going to say there's a difficulty because many of us don't um, necessarily deal directly with story and are more like on the other side, but I'll let Laura talk. I've done so much talking, I feel really bad. <laughs> story is one of those interesting ones that actually you could maybe just be a writer without having to be super technical. That was one of the ones that I had thought that like, maybe that was an option. Um, and it can sort of divide into like a writer and a narrative designer. And the narrative designer part is definitely a bit more technical because then you have to design things and make it work with the actual game. Um, be good at writing. Like, re like read widely, uh, consume widely, know how to tell stories from other perspectives that aren't yours. Um, like speak with other people's voices. Like, I'm not a writer, so I can't speak to this with authority, but... Yeah, there's great writers out there that you can look up to, certainly. You yeah, tried very hard to get a, a writer on the panel, but no <laughs> no luck this time. Maybe that's for the next one. There's a, a writer that's local to Cambridge, actually. I used to work with him. I think he's amazing. His name's John Ingold. He works for Inkle Studios. He does a lot of talks, GDC, yeah, Eurogamer, Res Talks, mm. that kind of thing. Look him up. He's on YouTube. Will do. Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. Like writings, I, I, <laughs> writings, I imagine another thing you could have like quite a large portfolio of that would be be quite relevant when when looking for those roles. So write a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Um, Naya has a question. Are there any networks, meetups for women specifically in games? Does anybody know of? Yeah, no, here in Canada. <laughs> so I don't think it's going to be very useful. <laughs> Uh, there's definitely like the women in games organization they do a bunch of stuff there may well be localized things there's also limit break you could look into they're like a mentorship scheme and i know they do a bunch of events and things too there's quite often events attached to bigger other events um i can't think of any off the top of my head because pandemic has ruined everything <laughs> um but you know like bright uh, develop which is in brighton may well have a women in games breakfast let's say um that kind of thing 
Thank you. So I was going through the last questions we had. Um, uh, Charlie was asking, is the QA into doing something else pipeline recommended? Was that in relation to a particular point in the conversation, Charlie? Sorry, are you speaking? Are you speaking to me, or is the person? No, who sorry, asked the question that was a student. Sorry. <laughs> that was a student. I was a little confused. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was very confusing of me. Oh no, I can't find it now. Is Charlie Elsessa? Yeah, uh, I can unmute you, Charlie, if you like. I said no. Uh, no, the answer was no. The answer was no. Oh, the answer was no. Fine, got it. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't work out if that was a separate question or relation into something else. I, I think that was was that not like a pretty that was people who used to try and do it that way where if you know longevity at your studio are showing an interest in in a certain area of QA you could maybe climb a ladder into the thing the discipline you wanted to do it through QA uh, but that's a double edged sword that one because you could end up being so good at audio QA that no one wants to let you go to the audio department because you're so good at testing the audio we don't want to lose our best audio QA for example, if a studio has that, this is just theoretical because we are a very small team and definitely don't have audio QA. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I technically, I, my personal opinion on it is that if you have a passion for a certain thing, continue with that passion and don't try and look at divergent routes to get to that route. You know, like focus on crafting the skills you need to get into the, the area and discipline that you think is best suit for you but that again that's my opinion more and maybe the other panelists will have a different view on that one i think you like to go into qa and use them to get somewhere else like it sort of does a dirty on qa like it's really disrespectful in some ways and a lot of people used to do it and qa is one of the most underappreciated disciplines in game in game development like they we wouldn't release anything without them and if we did it would be full of awful awful horrific things that you would never ever want to play um side note if somebody released a, a thing with a bug in it they knew about it they just couldn't fix it in time um but um i guess it's possible but yeah as as andrew says do the thing that you love don't don't try to use somebody else to get where you need to be because it might not pay out very well Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Kevin. Um, are there any important tips for game jams for someone who has never been to one? Okay, uh, I can speak to this. Uh, I've got uh, uh, three very important tips. One, bring plenty of food and water <laughs> because you'll be there for a long time and uh, it, it's quite pressing. Two, go with someone else you know uh, because that will like that will really, and you're here. You're on this call. You definitely know other people who will be interested in going to to a game jam. So go with someone else. That camaraderie will make the uh, make the experience like much much more enjoyable and and more supportive. And number three is do not try and do too much in one go at the game jam. You haven't got much time. Um, there are a lot of things to do, and you will encounter along the way problems that you didn't think of when you started out. So start with something really really simple and make the best version of the really, really simple thing that you can make and only then make it fancier. And the truth is you will probably never get go to a game jam and get to the make it fancier stage. I never have. <laughs> I'm gonna add to this one. Number four, sleep. Sleep is very important. Uh, and number five, try and balance the team. Um, so you can quite, I've seen game dev teams where like there was like a ton of artists and barely any technical people and they don't go very well because there's basically like one person doing all the work. Um, and as a side of that, if you do have one technical person, make the thing that they're good at doing. Like if they're really good at making puzzle games, don't try and make them make a first person shooter because it's going to go badly, especially in like a very restrictive time limit. It's like control your scope, as, as Charlie said, don't try to do too much. Um, I have one more note for that one as well in the sense of it, coming from the audio perspective don't be afraid to make all like go ahead make all your assets think you're going to get them in the game but then be don't be disappointed when you get told at the last minute no one has any time to implement the audio because <laughs> that, <is, laughs> that happens an awful lot in your first few game jams you know where you're just like I've made all these things and everyone goes 
where we're putting them. There's no, there's nowhere hooked up to put them in. And again, and it's why audio people tend to learn to be a bit more technical as well, so they can implement them themselves. That's that's why you learn where they learn that on game jams. But the other thing is just you know if if it's you know if you fail at it and it doesn't work perfectly and it's a really messy game jam, that's fine. Take all those experience and use them to go to the next game jam with probably a, a much better approach to it from that. Excellent advice. Thank you. And a, a really great, great question there. That's the end of our questions, I think, unless I've skipped anything or missed anything. Um, I think that's everything. We've yeah. ripped through them. They're fantastic questions. Thank you, everyone. Has anybody got any other questions to add to the chat just as we're, we're finishing finishing up? There was one, one person's just said here, um, oh, Julia said, can we reach out to some of you by email to get advice on our current art portfolios? So I, I don't feel happy um, to share your email addresses. I can I can send those to the to the people who've, who've um, been on the call today and been been here if you're happy with that. So I'll, I'll email you about that separately, if that's OK. Um, so that's great. So I suppose we can. I'd quite like to just sort of finish with asking you all, each one of you, um, just your kind of top tip or top resource that you recommend to students. Um, your kind of one top tip of, of people who, who are really inspired by what you said today and, and would like to kind of follow in your footsteps and, and start researching more into the games industry. Vivian, do you want to go first? I'll go in my screen again. It's probably an easy way to do it. Wow. One top tip, um, I'd say that uh, research a lot and, uh, you know, try and, you know, get your hands on, uh, you know, try to do something if it's, you know, art related. And if you want to, you know, learn modeling, you know, grab some tutorials, try to, you know, model, get some, you know, learn some game engines, uh, you know, Unreal, they're all free for students. So you can do that. Uh, I feel that uh, it's always best that you try yourself to see if, you, if it's something you like before you actually go and, and pursue this thing more in depth. Uh, because maybe along the way, you're going to see, oh, maybe I don't want to do modeling. Maybe I just want to do texturing or maybe I want to do lighting. And you just find out why you're doing it. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good tip. You, you might change your, your, uh, your idea or when you're doing, when you're actually you know, doing the job. Thank you, Vivian. Charlie, what's your Ooh. tip? Okay, well, I guess my, my tip is both somewhat obvious, but also you would be amazed at the number of people who walk into an interview and haven't done this. And my tip is make games. Uh, there, are, there are enough of you on this call and there are, you're, you're in a fantastic place where you have access to a diverse group of people with different skills who are all interested in making games. Uh, and the most the most valuable thing you can do if you want to get a role into in the game industry is to make make a lot of games. They don't have to be good. They don't have to be big. Uh, they don't have to be complicated. Um, but there is no substitute for actually doing it and learning and encountering all the problems that that you will find along that journey. And again, there are so many free online resources that that will help you make games. You don't even have to make something original. You can go, I liked this game. Let's we're going to try and make the same game. And it, that sounds that sounds stupid, but you'll be amazed how much you will learn by doing that process and going, okay, can I? How do I replicate that asset and make it show on my computer in in this console? Like, how do I do that? And just asking those questions and, and doing that process, you will learn far more than I think uh, you could learn from, from any other way to, to get into this industry. And it will give you an amazing portfolio when you go into actually trying to get roles after university. Mm -hmm. So you can go, look at all look at all this rubbish I made, and this is all that I learned from, from doing that. And that that's the that's by far the best thing that you can show in an interview. Fantastic. Great advice. Andrew. Yeah, I think um, resonating with Charlie's point there is like showing your work, showing everything you do, even from the earliest stages to later, because I, I think that moves on to the point that I, I thought first of all, which was don't be afraid to kind of fail a lot, because there's a lot of um, the only way you're going to get better 
is if you do your audio wrong or you do your code wrong or you do something wrong and the errors just keep coming up and just know that the next error that you shows up means you've actually made progress. That's a good sign. You know, you're making your way forward. Um, and that the next, you know, when someone reviews your audio and says that, you know, it doesn't sound quite right, that's not a bad thing. That just means that you, you've still got something to learn there and you can keep going and, and showing that off. And then the more you do that, the more work you will have to show off in the end. So, yeah, don't be... Don't be afraid to fail your, fail your way up the way, which is what kind, kind of happens with this. And not in the old fashioned sense of that one. It, it really does build your skills and learn and grow. Um, and uh, what was the other bit I was thinking of there was, um, ah, I've forgotten what it was actually. <laughs> and my, and my um, mutterings, but yeah, basically, yeah, just show off your stuff. And if, it, if it's bad, it's okay. Just keep growing from it. Oh, that was it. Because not everybody, people take, sorry, <laughs> people okay. take a long time to get to the roles that they actually want to get to. And that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people don't talk about. Like I was five years of floating around trying to figure out exactly where, how to get my first game audio job. It took me a long time, mm -hmm. but it was worth every single year I put into that. Stick at it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Laura, how about you? If you can find one tip. <laughs> I, I mean, I was going to say something really boring, but I, I will follow on really briefly from this talk about like showing your work thing with arts. If you're going to have an art station, put the best stuff front and center. And then if you do have work in progress stuff, kind of put it in a folder off to the side because you like it's great to see you're working. It's great to see your journey. But if you're trying to get something, I want to know that this is your latest and greatest. Um but yeah, no, my 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 tip was basically going to be there's just a couple of websites or places that you could check out. So there's Into Games and there's Grads in Games have a lot of resources for what the various jobs are in games and like what sort of skills you might need and what sort of things you might need to learn. They also run game jams and have competitions and various bits and pieces and have like some communities and stuff that you can join to just sort of see what everyone else is doing, share your ideas, get feedback, that kind of stuff. Maybe even pick some teammates up for game jam stuff. So, yeah. Fantastic. Really great tips and advice. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a really fascinating um, meeting and session. Um, it's been great to hear the different perspectives, so from the visual, audio and the more technical side as well. And I feel we've only really scratched the surface of the industry. So I'm sure there'll be another panel coming, coming your way very soon. Um, thank you so much, panel, for taking your time today to, to meet with us. Um, to the audience, thank you very much for coming along. It's been great to have so many of you here and really great questions as well to, um, to add to the session. So thank you so much for that. And I'll be sending you um, a feedback survey. It'd be really helpful for us if you could just fill in those few questions just to help us improve and make sure that we're, we're giving you the best sessions that we can here. So um, we'll bring the session to a close. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you again, hopefully.